guys my channel so today I'm going to be doing a read with me I've not done one in about a month and basically I, I was struggling to think of content to do for November because I'm trying to save all my good ideas for vlogmas so I'm not really uploading makeup looks at least not at the moment so I'm trying to do more talky videos but today I'm going to be reading chapter one from Deadfall by Joan Locke doesn't have like a bib not bibliol not bibliography it doesn't have a blurb on and it doesn't say in the inside either I did a quick check before I was about to do this video and the first chapter is quite short so you're not gonna hear me talking for too long but I'm just gonna do like a rude with me sort of mini series on this channel to try and take me closer towards December. But without further ado, let's just get into the video. Let's just begin with the reading. It's common knowledge that the borough market on a Saturday night is not a safe place for a lone policeman. Even one such as Detective Constable Jack Waters, who was wearing inconspicu inconspicuous private clothes. Indeed, it is particularly dangerous for him. If his identity is revealed, he will be seen as a spy. It is also common knowledge that costermongers hate policemen and can't wait for them to be drawn into a fight so they can all join in. Muzzling a copper is their favourite sport and one well worth serving time for. Consequently, Waters tries not to attract attention as he pushes his way through the dregs of society who gather in the borough market at this hour. Drunken roughs, prostitutes, pickpockets and the mostly unwashed poor. He is almost deafened by the shouts of the stallholders trying to outdo each other, promoting their dubious swears and the jingle jangle of a piano organ relentlessly churning out popular tunes. The occasional glimpse of a uniformed colleague in his snug high western tunic brings some reassurance. Sensibly, these policemen inspect neither the merchandise nor the pedestrians too closely, but maintain a remote and benign air. It does not take much to set off a riot in the borough market on a Saturday night. Waters isn't exactly alone, but his, uh, but his companion, an informant named Clifford Armit Armitage, is not only unlikely to be of any help in rescuing a policeman in trouble, but his appearance does attract attention. Armitage is very much the top with his cream cashmere overcoat and his black shallow crowned bowler with its sharply curved brim. The fact that he has just revealed that he is carrying a revolver and settles waters even more. The pair come to a halt outside a paint shy green door next to a green grocer's shop that is still doing brisk business. The detective makes it plain that he thinks they are wasting their time looking for the wanted man in there. Armitage sighs and insists that this time they will catch him. Leave it to me, he mutters contemptu contemptuously. As he is speaking, the green door opens and a middle-aged couple and a young man emerge. The older man has a jaunty but slightly nervous air while the young one is cheerful but appears somewhat frail. The woman who carries the shopping basket is plump and of homely but spirited aspect. All three are dressed rather more colourfully and cheerfully than the rest of the crowd. They are the strolling players, Mr and Mrs Jarvis and their son Shakespeare. After they have moved away, Clifford Armitage approaches the green door and raps on it sharply. Looking back, Mrs Jarvis notices the elegant stranger at her door. While her nervous husband bolts into the into a pub, she pulls her shawl around her in the manner of many a beleaguered stage heroine and goes over to inquire what he wants. Assuming a compassionate manner, Armitage explains to her that he is a friend of the poor couple who has been staying with them and he wants to help them. Mrs Jarvis gives him a look of disgust. We've discovered that the husband is a bad lot, she says indignantly, an escaped convent, convict in fact, that has already brought trouble with the police onto Mr Jarvis. 
She straightens her shoulders, pulls her shawl more tightly, shawl more tightly around her, and declares, "We want nothing more to do with either of them, lest we be charged with harbouring." Then off she goes, like the other women shoppers, to buy the makings of their Sunday dinner. Suddenly, a panicky Mr. Jarvis arrives, arrives, mopping his brow, then dropping his handkerchief in in his confusion. He tugs out his key and proceeds to open the green door. Armitage and Waters manage to confuse him over his handkerchief. The flustered man is vaguely aware of danger, so assumes an air of nonchalance, pretends he does not live above the green grocers, and wanders off again, quite forgetting about the key. A triumphant Armitage uses the key. Sorry about that. I don't think they were the red arrows, but. That looks very similar. They could have been the red arrows. They seemed very low. Ugh, where am I? A triumphant armistice uses the key to gain entrance, then re-emerges, hands it to Waters and tells him to fetch more police. If they're here, I'll give the signal, then come in at once. Inside the flat, at the top of the stairs, are the, escape are the escaped convict, convict Harold and his wife Bess. He is dark and handsome in a very strong and manly way, with a broad chest and powerful shoulders. She, though frail and poorly dressed, is blonde and beautiful. They are eagerly awaiting the arrival of Seth Green, who, by telling the truth about his part in Harold's downfall, will exonerate him. They hear sounds on the stairs. It's Preen, Bess, ex Bess exclaims excitedly. She rushes towards the door, opens it, then slams it shut again. No, it's Clifford Armitage, she shouts in horror and flings the bolt across. Eventually, she lets Armitage in, pretending that Harold has escaped. But the man's insults soon draw the, soon draw the fugitive, fugitive out of hiding. Clifford is Harold's cousin, and the man who not only committed the crime of which he was accused, but also stole Harold's inheritance. Harold's pent up anger is matched by Clifford's frustration at Harold's determination to escape the net he has so carefully spun around him. Fierce and furious fifty cuffs ensue. The fighting pair bursts through into the back parlour. Clifford, realising he is getting the worst of it, draws his revolver, but Harold snatches it from him, making makes him kneel and holds the weapon to his head. Suddenly there is a loud banging on the flat door and the voice of Detective Waters is heard shouting, Police! Open the door! Harold now feels he has nothing to lose. He will never get justice. If you speak one word, you're a dead man, he hisses at Clifford. The next moment, the parlour is filled with policemen. Clifford makes a plunge with the revolver which goes off. This acts as a rallying cry to the crowd gathering outside. They begin to murmur their disapproval of police action. Harold dashes to the back parlour window, opens it and leaps out on the roof of the cobbler's stall just below. From there he jumps onto the ground and begins to run. His way is blocked by a police inspector and a constable. He fights them desperately, knocking them both to the ground, who is grabbed from behind and held by waters. Harold, the escaped convict, so close to finding justice, is recaptured. The crowd begin to bunch and yell, let, let him go. He ain't, he ain't done nothing. Bleed him, Rogers. Let's have him. They advance menacingly, their cries ugly and deafening. They are halted for a moment by a pistol shot. More rabble pours. More rabble pour in from all directions sensing the opportunity for a fight. More police follow. All hell breaks loose. Knives and coshes emerge. Fists fly. Raucous shouts blend with blood curdling screams and the crunch of boots finding their targets. There is a riot. The music swells to a dramatic crescendo while the lights are lowered, blacking out the scene. Helen leans over the over to Best, who was sitting beside her in the princess's theatre stalls. Realistic, is it? Absolutely, he laughs. It was like that every Saturday night in the Borough Market, 
less sometimes. Okay, now that ending, uh, that's the end of the chapter one. That ending of the chapter was quite surprising. It was a play. What the? I'd like to point out, I've never actually read the book. I don't know whether I mentioned it, but I've not actually read the book. But, that seems to be quite a good book. I literally just picked out two books that I found. Because I have got a couple. And I need to pick out a, bit more, a few more for the videos. Okay, now I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys did, don't forget to smash a big thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe down below and turn on those post notifications so you know when I next upload. Comment any video ideas for the rest of November because I'm literally stuck. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!